Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. My name is Pavel Fara. I am the communication manager at the British Chamber of Commerce. And I'm very delighted that I can welcome you at the Green Finance Panel of the Green Growth Online Conference. And thank you for joining our panel. Before we start, let me introduce the moderator and expert guarantor of the panel, Mr. Jaroslav Vík. Since 1991, Yaroslav has been actively involved in many projects in the field of business advisory, energy and environmental consultancy and in the financing of, financing, financing of sustainability investments. Since 1994, Yaroslav is the CEO at Enviros Group, which is a leading energy and environmental consultancy company in the CEE region. Yaroslav, many thanks for taking part in this panel, and please kindly introduce the speakers of our panel and the floor, respectively the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great pleasure to be part of this fantastic event. I have got the chance to see some of the previous presentations and they were really excellent. Uh, I hope you had a nice break. You could get some reasonable, reasonable refreshment. So we can now fully focus on a green finance panel. Uh, let me introduce uh, our presenters. Uh, Eva Buchkova, uh, ING Bank. She is the senior uh, advisor. Uh, to uh, the uh, wholesale banking and uh, uh, Pavel Štefek uh, from PWC Czech Republic, partner at <clears throat> Risk Assurance. And uh, last but not least, uh, Michal Nebeský, city country officer uh, uh, for the Czech Republic and uh, uh, Slovakia. Uh, this panel will focus on the uh, green finance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when I saw these graphs uh, 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 a few uh, years ago, uh, I thought that uh, there is a, a very nice explanation there for um, the need for the green finance. Um, the climate change, of course, includes quite a lot of financial risks. And uh, uh, I was surprised uh, how big proportion of uh, the uh, global catastrophe and losses is actually uh, due to the um, uh, events which are related to the climate change. It's uh, around nowadays, it's around 90 or over 90 percent of the total uh, um, disaster events which are related uh, to the um, uh, global change and the climate issues and in, in the percentage of terms of a total volume uh, it is uh, around 80 percent and it goes uh, close to 120 billion US dollars. That's quite a lot. Uh, so it's a time to reset the relationship between finance and the real economy. It's uh, important to start uh, to do something with that. Uh, as uh, a lot of, of the previous speakers uh, strengthened this, uh, I would uh, definitely would like to support that as well. It's time for public and private finance to get behind the transition to a sustainable and resilient future for all of us. Trillions of dollars in investment will be required to transition the global economy to net zero emissions and 
avert a climate catastrophe. This represents a massive opportunity for capital providers. However, many of the investments needed are large and risky, especially in emission-intensive heavy industrial and mobility sectors. In order for transition to be successful, finance, industry and public sector must work together. Uh, the process has started already some time ago, but what was important was especially the year 2015, because landmark of international agreements were concluded with the adoption of United Nations 2030 Agenda and Sustainable Development Goals, and also with the Paris Climate Agreement. The Paris Climate Agreement in particular includes the commitment to align financial flows with a pathway towards low carbon and climate resilience development. Following that, in December 2019, the Commission, European Commission presented the European Green Deal, a growth strategy aiming to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. And as a part of a Green Deal, the Commission presented also in January 2020 a European Green Deal investment plan that should mobilize at least one trillion of sustainable investment over the next decade. And it will enable a framework to facilitate public and private investment needed for the transition to a climate neutral, green, competitive and inclusive economy. Reaching the current 2030 climate and energy targets alone would already require additional investment of approximately Euro 260 billion a year by 2030. Next slide please. How we can define sustainable and green finance? Sustainable finance refers to a financial service integrated environmental, social and governance criteria into the business or investment decisions. Green finance is any structural financial activity, product or service that's been created to ensure a better environmental outcome. It includes an array of loans, debt mechanisms, and investments that are used to encourage the development of green projects or minimize the impact on the climate or more regular projects, or a combination of both. Two main goals of green finance are to internalize environmental externalities and to reduce risk perception. Promoting green finance on a large and economically viable scale helps ensure that green investments are prioritized over business as usual investments that perpetuate unsustainable growth patterns. Green finance encourages transparency and long-term thinking of investments flowing into environmental objectives and includes all sustainable development criteria identified by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Next slide, please. As we could see, a lot of, a lot of financing is needed. To reach the goals. The financing gap to achieve the SDGs is estimated to be two and a half trillion per year in developing countries alone. The transition to low carbon economy requires substantial investments which can only be financed through a high level of private sector investments. The adoption of SDGs consideration in private investment is evolving from a risk management practice to a driver of innovation and new opportunities 
that create long-term value for businesses and society. However, mobilizing capital for green investment has been limited due to several macroeconomic challenges. For example, maturity mismatches between long-term green investment and the relatively short-term time horizon of investors. Financial and environmental policy approaches have often not been coordinated to scale up and crowd in private sector finance government can team up with a range of factors to increase capital flows and develop innovative financial approaches across different asset classes, notably through capacity building initiatives, incentives. With the invest, estimated investment of over 6 trillion required by 2030 to limit global warming to 2 degrees, these measures help clarify the responsibilities of financial institutions with respect to environmental factors within the capital markets, as such clarifying relevant ESGs issues within the context of fiduciary duties of pension funds and strengthen flows of information related to environmental factors within the financial system for instance, requirements for public disclosure of climate-related risks to investment portfolios. Channeling these investments is a critical challenge for the global financial system. Investors who represent more than 45 trillion in assets under management have already agreed to drive climate change action across their portfolios. Sustainable finance has therefore become an integral part of how many financial services firms operate. I believe that sustainable finance combined with technological innovations and a digitalization of banking will be instrumental to sustainable innovation and growth and the transition to less carbon intensive economy. Green transition is both an urgent existential imperative as well as a significant commercial opportunity. Capturing this opportunity will drive job creation and speed the return to growth. But for now, there is a persistent, persistent Financing, between, financing gap between net zero ambitions and the reality. And how it is in practice, we would like to hear from our presenters. And let me introduce first our first speaker. Pavel Stefek, as I mentioned, is a partner and risk assurance in a PWC, Czech Republic. He is a leader of environmental, social and governance services with specific focus on non-financial reporting, carbon footprint and supply, ch supply chain. Pavel specialized in an automotive and energy industry. And uh, what interests me actually quite a lot, he was also for a certain period of time assigned at PwC Canada in Toronto. I wanted to first, because he, before he starts with his presentation, uh, about uh, his view, what is the difference in between the uh, Czech and the Canadian approach uh, to the uh, sustainability. I've recently read an article which I think was published by the European Investment Bank uh, that uh, in terms of um, uh, looking at uh, the tools or instruments which can support uh, 
the um, transition malls uh, in um, Americas, North America and uh, Asia as a first instrument is seen the technical development. Um, as opposite in uh, the Europe, it's actually the behavioral change. Uh, Pavel, how it is uh, according to your understanding? Is uh, the behavior change uh, and the technical uh, outputs, uh, uh, how you see that in compare from your uh, uh, Canadian experience? Well, it's been a quite a while since I returned from Canada. It's already been almost five years. But uh, what I saw it the most was while I was basically spending some time in the western part of, of Canada, in, in British Columbia, where, for example, they took it seriously because already at this point in time, they really invested in that. And even the companies were actually producing um, the, I would say, non-financial reporting and stating in that how they behave and how they invest in the technologies to really make a difference, to really change and make sure that their businesses are sustainable and they do something in terms of, you know, making sure that, you know, we have a healthy environment going forward. And it's been like, when I was there like five years ago, I know that it has been, it had been the practice back then for already a couple of years. I know that my colleagues were heavily focused on that at PwC, basically advising the clients essentially in those things and in, in investing in, in technologies and in green solutions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we know that uh, your presentation will be mainly focused on the point of view of uh, business. So uh, how you see the uh, sustainability financing from this point of view? Yeah, so basically, I, I, as you said, I will be talking about the EU Green Finance Set of Regulation and how it will impact the companies going forward, right? So basically, um, it's always a question of what can we expect and what should we prepare for as a company, right? The European financial market will change. And the change is already underway predominantly on a voluntary basis or requested by a stakeholder, for example, your investor, right? I'm sure that many of you heard about green bonds or sustainability performance ratings. However, uh, the mentioned regulation will accelerate the, the market change significantly. We can expect the changes already at the beginning of 2022. And from that point on, the financial market will start applying what we call invisible green hand of the market. So maybe if we can pull up the slide. Yes, thank you. So what we can expect, right? So the capital flow will be predominantly directed towards sustainable businesses, sustainable products, and sustainable, and what we've already discussed, technological solutions. So sustainability risk will be newly monitored by basically by your bank, and this will be reflected and added into your risk profiles. Uh, what is also important to mention that the sustainability is a long-term thing, right? And it's about transparency. So this will be the new norm. So you will be asked by your bank to present your long-term goals. This means that you will, you will have to be looking into the future to 2020, 2030, or maybe even beyond that. Um, so, and of course, the question is always, how do I demonstrate 
that my business is sustainable. So we hear about sustainability a lot, but what does actually mean? Of course, it means that acting sustainably, but it all starts with having the sustainability strategy and goals. And by demonstrating that you are able to fulfill these goals and by managing your sustainability risks. Uh, your sustainability strategy and governance are important, but what is equally important is, is your ability to disclose the information about your journey, about your sustainability. And it's not about at a point in time, but how you're basically developing and improving over the time. So the non-financial reporting will actually be what we call a vehicle to demonstrate to your bank, but not just to your bank, that your sustainable activities are monitored and measured, right? You can expect to some extent that the reporting will be requested by your bank similarly to what they request, you know, for example, as part of the financial statements. So it will be equally important. Um, of course, to, to a certain degree, the non-financial disclosures will be asked, that will be asked by your bank, will depend on the sustainability risk policy of a particular bank. However, you can expect questions related to climate change because climate change is the first and main focus area of the European Union. So the questions that can be asked are, for example, do you measure your greenhouse gas emissions from your production or from the purchase electricity? Or what is the ratio of renewable energy used to power your business. So these are just an examples, but the more specific guidance will be provided by the non-financial reporting directive. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the non-financial reporting directive is actually expected to give more stringent rules to non-financial reporting. The draft of the directive is expected at the beginning of this April. We didn't see it yet actually, right? So, but uh, we can share with you what we expect to see in the directive. The directive should shed actually more light on the extent of reporting, actually the scope of the reporting, its format, and it's further expected certain unification and simplify reading the, info, uh, the, the report by introducing a structure of the report. There is actually another important task that the non-financial reporting directive authors set forth to satisfy. The directive should ensure actually that the non-financial information will exist about all the significant market players. So it's, all, it's always a question, what is a significant market player? So what we expect to see in the regulation that it will be a company with more than 500 employees. And this will be the produce, the production of the non-financial reporting will be an obligation for such a company. And of course, it goes without saying that the banks will actually collect the non-financial information from the reports, right? So. It's, as I said, it will be a, a vehicle to demonstrate your sustainability activities. And what is also important to mention is that it's about assurance, right? So how to make sure that the data are actually complete and accurate, right? So the banks will not allow greenwash data in their sustainable risk models. So, so firstly, the banks are required to perform sustainability due diligence under sustainability finance disclosure regulation already from the beginning of 2022. Therefore, a sample-based assurance of your non-financial disclosure can be expected. 
Moreover, it is expected that the assurance will be required as an integral part of the non-financial assurance process. So that it means that each sustainability report will have to be audited before it is issued. It is issued. So it's essentially as the, non as, as the financial statements are audited by auditors, then what we expect that it will apply also for the non-financial reporting. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, uh, quite a complex issue actually. Uh, before we uh, pass uh, to to next uh, next uh, speaker, um, uh, if I could uh, ask a couple of questions. Um, uh, Non-financial reporting, in the way you have described, it may sound quite complex um, or even difficult uh, exercise for companies uh, which uh, don't currently report at this moment. Would you share with us your recommendation on how to start with um, such um, uh, activity? Yeah, yeah indeed, it's, it's very complex and this is what we can see at our clients, right? Because you have to collect the data from various departments, like from procurement, maybe from HR, from compliance and others. And the information is in various systems, or maybe not, it's not even in the systems, and it may be stored in some Excel spreadsheet somewhere on the shared drive, right? So uh, that's that's the that's the tricky part. And the thing is that you don't only collect the information, which is the first step. Um, there is a new role for top management actually where it all starts to set a governance structure so it's it's really should start with the strategy so that's the i would say underlying element and then setting up the governance structures and kpis to really manage it from the strategic point of view and then just drilling down setting up the reasonable goals and measuring those those goals on a regular basis and for example, what we do in, in PwC, we have developed a system that facilitates the reporting process. It has a logic into that, so it can help the companies to produce actually the non-financial information. But, but anyways, what is really crucial here is to have a strong government structure, basically driven from the top management. And I think uh, what, I, what, what I'm usually saying is try to get the sustainability into the company's DNA because not, it's not a particular topic for a particular, for example, board member. It's, it's, it's a topic that, is, that the company has to live it, has to live it right in order to be successful and make as much as possible out of it. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, thank you, Pavel. Uh, you uh, have mentioned sustainability, uh, uh, risk uh, or ESGs, uh, risk modeling uh, of bank. Uh, how should management of companies work with this information? Yeah, we can, for example, take as an example, loan underwriting. For example, non-financial data will be disclosed and submitted into the bank, right? And then the data will be scored financial data and if you are able to demonstrate an excellent ESG performance you are able to get a really great ESG rating so you're positioned as a company that invests and in sustainability is, 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 is basically the position from this perspective then what it means that it will be reflected in the price for example of your loan so the company will ultimately get much lower interest rate than the company that basically don't produce any information or 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 is unable to transform its, its business into more sustainable business so the non-financial performance becomes really important even for cfos right as i said at the beginning that the basically the capital will be channeled or directly directed to the sustainable businesses yes Yes, uh, uh, very true. 
Okay, thank you for now, Pavel. Uh, we will have some more questions to come in the Q&A session. Uh, but let me uh, allow now uh, to introduce uh, Eva Bučová um, uh, I, from ING Bank. Um, uh, Eva has a, over 20 years of banking experience. Uh, and uh, she went through various banking houses such as Commerce Bank, ING, Erste Group, and uh, European Investment Bank. Uh, uh, she worked in uh, the several regions uh, with uh, in the Central Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, Western uh, European countries, and has a role had a role uh, within wholesale banking. Uh, uh, also, uh, she uh, worked uh, uh, in a complex transaction and project uh, management. Uh, uh, she is currently with ING client coverage team in Prague, while primarily focusing on strategic capital restructuring and advisory and sustainability and sustainability finance. Uh, Eva is also acting as a chair of sustainability committee at ING Czech Republic. Um, uh, let me have one uh, question related uh, to your uh, 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 short uh, uh, information provided. Uh, there is a mention that you are a promoter of a sustainable finance uh, and you are actively engaged in var various sustainability driven activities such as Zmena uh, Klepšimu uh, or partners for sustainability. How important do you think are these activities in, in the, in the uh, current uh, situation? Uh, thank you, Jaroslav, uh, for, for a very nice intro and uh, also for the, for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, these external activities have been something which has uh, evolved during uh, COVID times. Uh, first meant as COVID recovery initiatives. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we are not in the recovery mode uh, yet. We are still uh, somewhere in the middle or uh, second third of it. But uh, uh, what I believe uh, is very essential, and you mentioned it very nicely, that what is really relevant uh, in uh, financing the transition or effectively transit the, the entire economy towards a more sustainable approach uh, it is uh, a combination of public and private, not just money, but also strategy. And uh, I believe these initiatives, other than awareness raising, uh, which was indeed very much missing uh, in the Czech Republic, but also in the entire Central Europe, uh, uh, it also serves the purpose of trying to really bring uh, all the people together who are first passionate uh, about sustainability, and who are the drivers of sustainability in their particular sectors? And why is it relevant from the sector perspective? I will introduce uh, uh, via our uh, short video, which we prepared for you, and then uh, in, in the subsequent questions, because indeed every sector has different needs, every sector has different drivers, and every sector will have to invest into something else. And uh, in order to understand this, these initiatives are very crucial, because each of the, these initiatives is effectively producing a set of recommendations, not just sector by sector, but also general, but who, uh, which need to be applied across the entire economy. And plus they, they are effectively, to me, they are functioning as a bridge, as a bridge between the public, the financial sector, the corporate sector and the government. And this is very much needed. These initiatives connect and bridge. And uh, for me, this is something which brings the change and perception. And ING, for ING, that's key uh, to embrace change and effectively uh, have stakeholder dialogues all around the economy. You're absolutely right. Yeah, all the stakeholders need to be involved. Okay, let's have a look at, the, at, at the, your uh, presentation and uh, the short uh, video. Thank you very much. So let's go for the video. You want to know about ING and sustainability. Because the simple fact is this, it's becoming even more important to more of you. And you care what companies are doing about it. 
So here it is. As a global bank with billions of euros flowing through our books, it's our duty to not only say no to financing that's harmful, but to say yes to financing change and making a positive impact. For ING, sustainability is about creating a healthy planet with prosperous people. What's the biggest challenge for the planet? The climate crisis. And what's a daily challenge for too many people? The statistics are clear. It's money. First, the climate crisis. There's a plan to keep global temperatures from rising too much, but it's not cheap. That's where we come in. Not only do we provide lending to green projects and companies, we help clients improve their own sustainability and reward them when they do. We finance the shift in technology needed to meet climate goals while measuring how we're doing and where we and our clients can do better. We call it our Terra approach. It makes us one of the first banks to measure and steer our portfolio in line with the Paris Agreement. Second, let's talk money. It's one of the leading causes of stress around the world. Half of households in Europe are struggling to make ends meet, and it affects more than our wallets. Financial health is also linked to our physical health and social well-being. As a bank, money is what we know best. We can help people be better at money too. We use our strength and innovation, creating things like forecasting tools and digital coaches. Financial health is also a part of our community involvement, like our partnership with UNICEF, where we help youth get the skills they need for a better future. Whether climate crisis or financial health, one thing is clear. No one sector can solve the world's problems, much less one bank. We seek out partnerships with peers, governments, and society. That's the only way we can make any meaningful positive impact. For us, for our customers, for the world. Very nice. You oh. want to know about ING? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, probably I go straight uh, to the second slide, but uh, before uh, flying through that, uh, it mentioned, this video mentioned actually two additional important things that uh, none of us can do this transition and change uh, on our own. And uh, we effectively, particularly these initiatives are uh, very important to bring all these stakeholders together uh, around one table. Uh, on the other side, uh, it is also uh, the financial sector who is pl playing a very important and crucial role in the transition. And how can it be uh, effectively? It can go and, and do via its own behavior, the, that's one thing. And second, via finance, because the financial sector knows finance the most. And this is where uh, the money effectively accumulates. And how can we do it via our own behavior? Well, we can lead by example. Without effectively knowing what a transition means, how could we advise our clients possibly on what transition do they need to make? So effectively, we uh, did also this homework on our own. Uh, effectively uh, through a, a, a number of measures. And as you might know, and, and Pavel, you mentioned it very nicely in your presentation, uh, it simply needs to go to your DNA uh, so that the entire organization effectively leaves the same direction. And uh, um, being in DNA, ING's history with sustainability is 25 years long. And we also, also started from zero, from nowhere, where we first uh, issued our sustainability report. And effectively after 25 years, ended up with uh, uh, hundreds of billions uh, on our books of green finance and hundreds of clients uh, whom we are trustfully advising on their way uh, to, towards a more sustainable future. So from that perspective, it takes a while. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it is uh, a complex issue at the same time, but we also decided that uh, we will try to simplify it uh, as much as possible. And if I can ask you for uh, putting the next slide, or the slide where we finish, exactly this one, thank you. Then uh, th there are usually very simple decisions uh, at the beginning which drive the entire development. And ING was effectively uh, one of the first banks to say no to tobacco production and downsize the tobacco business as a part of social commitment. Second, ING said also uh, no as one of the first banks to, to finance new coal resources and downsize its coal production portfolio. Of course, it's not always an easy question, an easy commitment. At the same time, ING also committed to renewable energy in all its own buildings and also signed up for a Real Estate 100 initiative. Since 2007, ING has been carbon neutral. 
And uh, ING also supports it, its clients on the transition path uh, via sustainable finance and advisory. And effectively, the second way through finance is probably the easiest one out of all the challenges uh, around. And these are uh, particularly green finance uh, projects for a specific ESG purpose. And I am highlighting ESG purpose because green finance is not just for environmental purpose. And these can be green loans or green and social bonds. What is the difference? Green loans are effectively bank loans, uh, which are for dedicated environmental, social or other purposes, uh, which contribute to ESG uh, improvement or a green and social bonds, which are very much the same in terms of the basics, but they effectively are capital markets instrument. Uh, so tapping into uh, various stakeholders pockets. And then we have transformational finance and we have mentioned it in the video also that we are helping to improve sustainability in general. So not a specific purpose is covered, which is environmental or social uh, as a project, but uh, there, is, there is a mechanism how to improve the overall sustainability rating of the company or develop and improve sustainability KPIs. And these can be from all three areas, E, S, G, or it is preferred that they are. And when the companies are improving, then they are uh, effectively decreasing their interest rates. So th this is the mechanism which provides also a certain level of incentive. And you might ask, okay, what types of projects you can finance via a green loan or green social bond, whatever that is in line with taxonomy uh, effectively. And uh, particularly, this is a very good link between what Pavel was mentioning in terms of reporting and taxonomy and what effectively financial sector is uh, taking now as a, as a basis uh, to, uh, to call something a green loan or green and social bond or uh, an, uh, a transformational loan. So from that perspective, uh, uh, taxonomy is very essential to speed up the transparency and speed up the focus uh, also of the entire financial sector and the corporates. And we have effectively supported a number of corporates who are uh, either building up renewable resources, who are building up new green infrastructure, who are helping to introduce new infrastructure which is uh, available to uh, socially uh, disadvantaged groups or who are building uh, effectively a new elements uh, in the infrastructure which will replace the old residuum. Whether it's about innovation or just improving the existing which is there available, everything can be considered from this perspective. And probably uh, that, that's just one, the, the professional uh, part or the, the business part, which is the core of our business. On the other hand, we have also our personal commitments as people. And here in the Czech Republic, we have effectively decided that uh, it's time to also take sustainability personal and see what does it do. Because in sustainability, what we particularly see is important the combination of bottom up and top down. And when the combination is healthy, there are very good results achieved. And probably that is something uh, which our next video will show. So I kindly ask you to put it on. We, the Czech management team, take sustainability serious. We believe the way to change goes from inside each of us individually. We also believe we shall lead by example and inspire others to act. Even if it's just baby steps, we jointly will embrace change out of the deepest of our hearts. This is our commitment. And it went like... This is my commitment. I think I have done a relatively okay job in, in keeping up to that commitment. More than 90%, 95% I guess of, of, of my time over the last year not eating meat and, and there are uh, occasionally a few exceptions. Uh, sushi, let's say without fish, is, is, is still very difficult. Um, but I think uh, by and large I'm, I'm keeping to my commitment. This is my commitment. So I bought a Keep Coffee. First, 249 crowns, saved 353 paper cups and 353 plastic covers per year. That's one thing. Second, I am not an anonymous client anymore. When my coffee maker sees this cup, he knows it's espresso macchiato forever, which is great. I started paying attention to the type of coffee I drink and to supporting local coffee makers. This is my commitment.
This is my commitment. I have kept my sustainability promise. I have been purchasing locally sourced fruit and vegetables from Czech farmers. And also, it is zero waste. The only wrapping that comes are these two boxes, paper boxes, that are reusable. This is my commitment. Happy to report that nowadays, at least twice a week, we're not eating any meat here at home. That wasn't so easy to do in the beginning. We needed to change our habits and find the right uh, alternatives. But nowadays, I must admit, I'm not missing it. This is my commitment. By applying the new way of working in 2020, I reduced my CO2 emissions by almost 70%. I saved almost three and a half tons of CO2. So a bit of uh, easiness uh, into the complexity uh, of sustainability, but indeed uh, when combined with the personal commitment, it brings very nice results. And let me jump into our, my very last slide. Um, uh, Pavel, if I can kindly ask you uh, for the slide which followed. Yes, this one. So effectively, uh, all this uh, efforts of individual people at the end resulted in a more institutionalized sustainability practice uh, in the Czech Republic at ING when we created uh, five working groups under a sustainability committee under one umbrella, each of them focusing on a different topic uh, as of knowledge sharing, responsible employer, uh, sustainable financing, also retail bank, although we are leaving the retail bank right now, uh, and communication. And effectively, it brought very concrete results. But when uh, speaking uh, only about environmental impact and about engagement uh, of our employees, I think what is important to mention that even extracting the COVID impact, we managed to reduce uh, CO2 emissions by 25%, uh, water consumption by 43%, waste by 10%, and we have additional big uh, ambitions. We have engaged uh, almost on a daily basis uh, 30 colleagues in sustainability and sustainability efforts, and 160 uh, effectively supported us uh, in, in our mission. So from that perspective, uh, in my view, a very big change because uh, their engagement in sustainability committee didn't only influence the way how ING Czech Republic was performing, but also how their families and their social circles were effectively running and how much, effect, uh, how much they were increasing their awareness about the sustainability topic as such. And probably at the, at the very end from my side, um, sustainability is not something new. Uh, we in Central Eastern Europe very well know what sustainability is. Many of us have been raised in, in families with a very sustainable attitude. It's not something which is a new buzzword. It, it, is, it is just a, a proper name for many things we have been doing already. Also, in, in terms of the, the financial sector as such, when I worked in other institutions and particularly European investment banks, I worked with a number of Czech, Slovak, Central Eastern European companies, as well as banks, who have been engaged in energy efficiency, renewable projects since more than decades. So it's not something which we don't know. We just call it now sustainable finance. So that, that's one thing and we just need to do more of it. Uh, and that, that's pretty much it. And, and try to make it in a way that really connects all the stakeholders. Uh, but otherwise, uh, Czech Republic has been very good in implementing uh, any energy efficiency types of initiatives from the European Commission uh, or through any kind of structured funds, although th there is always a gap which could have been done better and, and feel better, but it is not something very new to us. So let's try to be very reasonable there and try to see what we are already doing and, and be, be really proud about that. There is still a lot to do, particularly Yaroslav, if you talk about all these billions and trillions uh, just for the Czech Republic in order to reduce emissions by 55% in 2030, I mean, investments of 500 billion Czech Corona will need to be done. Until 2050, it is one of uh, one to four trillions, depending on what really, what direction Czech Republic wants to go. So indeed, a synergy and accelerating effect of private and public uh, presence and interaction is absolutely necessary. So we are happy that we are one of the banks who can support this change. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. I like the uh, personal uh, lead examples uh, and the results you reached, actually. Uh, in your video, there was reference to the project Terra. 
uh, as a, a unique project serving as a basis of inspiration for the entire financial sector. Um, when it comes to managing your lending portfolio towards the Paris Agreement commitments, uh, can you tell us more <clears throat> what effectively ING is doing and what other institutions could do take an example? Yeah, and thank you very much. Uh, Terra project is indeed something uh, which was built up from scratch uh, as, uh, as a tool. Uh, when ING signed up to Paris Agreement, uh, of course, it started scratching its head. Uh, how are we going to do that? And uh, what is it we have to contact beforehand? So effectively, we need to, needed to look into our portfolios and try to see how can we identify first the way we are going and uh, figure out whether this way we are going is sufficient to reach uh, Paris Agreement. And if not sufficient, what needs to be done? So what ING did effectively in cooperation with various think tanks and the digital platforms is that uh, it analyzed uh, who are the biggest contributors to CO2 emissions. That's the first thing. Which sectors these are, which were at, at the beginning six uh, key sectors, and now they are extended to nine and then identify the major technological shifts in each of the sectors and has measured that, okay, if we stay with the portfolio like, like this, we will never reach Paris Agreement. We need to help actually our portfolio to move towards a Paris Agreement via implementing the right technological shift. And th this is pretty much what all the banks can do now. We have a number of partnering banks uh, now, uh, more than 10 uh, on, on the global scale who are testing the system where they can feed in their portfolio data and they effectively get a, a response. Are you on your way to Paris Agreement or not? And if not, what technological shift needs to be done in your portfolio? And of course, as you mentioned, and Jaroslav, you mentioned it very correctly, in an inclusive manner, it needs to be done the way that effectively we, uh, uh, we impact the change which is happening there and try to effectively show best practices, and that's the purpose of today's discussion as well, how the leaders in these industries are moving and whether the, the rest is following the right direction or a different direction and why is that and whether they will achieve that. It's a very sophisticated tool and, I, and ING is the first one to also report on its way a sector by sector, which is uh, really, a, really a, a good job, uh, I must say, and a very new one in the sector. But there are many banks already following this which is uh, a very good result. Perfect, yeah. That definitely will be very uh, useful and uh, interesting piece of uh, information. Um, and also, uh, if I can have another question, Eva. You mentioned transformational finance as a part of sustainable finance. Um, can you elaborate on it, on it a little bit more? Um, please, particularly how banks can really help the companies in their behavior change and sustainability strategy implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, transformational finance, uh, uh, as I mentioned already before, uh, can be linked to certain KPIs or uh, sustainability ratings. And effectively, the company, what they need to do uh, is to define a, a way how step by step they can improve either the sustainability rating or sustainability KPIs, be it uh, CO2 uh, production, be it uh, consumption of water, be it uh, gender equality, be it uh, uh, whatever other social uh, aspect or environmental and governance uh, you can take in that particular industry. And step by step, as they are uh, doing better and better, they are effectively changing the entire behavior and perception of sustainability in the company. So for that, it's not just uh, sufficient to sign up to a KPI, but it's, uh, it's necessary to uh, fulfill it. So uh, from that perspective, uh, this is how banks can incentivize uh, the, the corporate sector uh, to change. And uh, the, the financial incentive is obviously there, but it should not be the main driver. Although indeed, uh, as we heard also during the conference, uh, many of the investments uh, effectively have a very good return, uh, but many also not, uh, and, and, and they are big. So from that perspective, uh, indeed, uh, financial incentive is not always the major driver, but uh, in, in many cases it is. Yes, and uh, of course the financial incentive is very important as well. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for, for uh, uh, the informations. 
and uh, now let me allow to uh, um, say a few words about uh, our uh, next speaker, uh, Mr. Michal Nebeski. Um, uh, Michal is the Citibank uh, country officer, how, uh, how the official title, title uh, sounds. Uh, he was appointed as the uh, city country officer in the Czech Republic in 2012. Um, uh, prior to his current role from 2008-2012, uh, Michal was the chief financial officer and member of the board of directors in the Czech Railway Company. Uh, so uh, he doesn't have only the experience from the banking sector, but also from the business. Um, he worked for Citibank already between the years 91 and 2008 on a several top manage managerial positions uh, uh, and in the more senior banking and risk roles. Um, he was also uh, appointed as a risk manager, management director in the Czech Republic in 2002 and uh, he also was responsible for uh, countries such as Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria and former Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia and Baltic states in 2006. Um, Michal, uh, could you please uh, say uh, us uh, the, a few words about uh, the uh, city and uh, his, its approach to uh, sustainability and green finance? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, uh, I will try not to echo what Pavel and Eva have already said, because there would be uh, a lot of similarities. Uh, you know, I've been around for 30 years and I have not lived uh, such a big change as we live uh, these days in the sustainability and, and uh, ESG um, uh, sphere. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really uh, growing exponentially in the last couple of years, even though uh, the history dates back uh, many, many, probably decades back uh, when it all started. Perhaps if we go to, 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 to uh, the slide, there is a time... Uh, uh, do, do, do. Yeah, one more. Yeah, this is it. So this is our journey. Uh, well, it, uh, if you've been around uh, for similar um, uh, years like me, you you will uh, uh, probably remember good old uh, finance UNIP initiative, good old Equator principles that all the big players adhered to. Uh, we were part of the creation, we were part of the implementation, we've always been uh, so big that uh, we simply could not uh, do anything else but to be one of the leaders and co-creators because that's what uh, we uh, wanted to do and that's what our role has always been. Now, we started in, in uh, like tangible uh, commitments in 2007 by then 10 years, uh, 50 billion climate initiative in financing. 50 billion from today's perspective looks uh, a very modest commitment. At the time, it, it was the very forefront of, of, uh, of uh, climate uh, related financial initiatives. We continued with uh, 100 billion in 2015 and uh, 250 billion commitment uh, last year. And it all culminated actually on the very first day of our new global CEO, Jane Fraser, that uh, she made a firm commitment to be uh, a net zero emissions company by 2050, very much in line with, uh, with uh, US administration and with, with the uh, Paris uh, uh, club. So uh, we are very serious about it. And I, I, you know, I, I don't want to, to take it as a marketing pitch of what, what City is doing, because I, I think the, the, the philosophy of it is, is a little bit more interesting, because one thing is for sure that banks, companies, 
we'll have to measure, disclose, and manage uh, ESG risk and reflect sustainability projects in their uh, in their daily life uh, sooner rather than later. And it will change the whole paradigm of, of, of uh, finances uh, on global scale. You know, I, I've been a risk manager before, so I know how to manage credit risk, hopefully market risk, operational risk. But we will measure, uh, report, and disclose uh, ESG risk as well. And we've been already doing it because we are uh, the, the, uh, the bank which uh, published uh, the first um, uh, TCFD task force on climate related disclosures report already in 2018. We published another report in 2020 and we are uh, working actually with PwC uh, predominantly uh, on, on developing uh, methodologies how to uh, be uh, not only ESG friendly, but how to make it uh, publicly available, how to manage it, how to best optimize our portfolio in the, in the, uh, in the quickly changing world uh, of finance and industry, obviously, and agriculture. So the whole planet is changing. The change has accelerated. And the question is how quickly we will be able to, to have uh, uh, global standards, global frameworks to, to, to allow all stakeholders to, to navigate uh, processes which are very complex at this point of time. You know. If we click uh, to the uh, next slide, please. Now, there are four buzzwords which are very important uh, in the whole uh, uh, story. One thing I already mentioned, it's guiding frameworks. There are still many. Uh, some are more influential than others. But I think the world needs frameworks to agree on so that everybody is able to, to manage uh, uh, on fair play basis and using uh, one uh, globally accepted methodology very important working progress uh, we're part of the, the the most important ones like the green bond principles and uh, principles for responsible banking etc so we do play uh, active role of influencer co-creator one of the very active participants in defining what are the frameworks the world is going to use soon to to measure Another dimension is investor pressure. You know, it's uh, uh, something which is increasingly uh, important role of uh, investors. And it goes all the way from hobby investors who own, uh, I don't know, 100 shares of city, all the way up to supranational or, or, or uh, hedge funds. Uh, all investors increasingly put uh, pressure on like ESG friendly and sustainable uh, uh, approach of, of uh, their, their investments, be it bank, be it industrial company, be it agri company, be it any industry you can think of. But uh, it's no longer just a game, it's reality. People are simply much more cognizant of the fact that the planet is at risk and that we'd better behave responsibly across the board and that we'd better demonstrate our responsibility even when making investment decisions. So it is no, no, no like hobby for, for us. It is serious pressure that the investors have started exercising on, on all uh, players on, on the market. Equally important is regulatory uh, development because uh, there are various uh, initiatives um, from uh, ECB relevant for, for, for us, uh, uh, TCFD I already mentioned. So uh, regulators will require banks, talking, narrowing it down to banks to, to uh, measure, disclose and manage ESG slash sustainable risk. And uh, again, uh, working progress, but developing quickly and very important part of, of the whole story. Carbon accounting, accounting is something which I put down like more uh, to, to highlight it because uh, it is probably like the buzzword of the buzzwords uh, that um, 
uh, we uh, will work towards net zero emissions by 2050. That's something that probably the whole world will agree to, to uh, strive to, to, to get. Um, uh, we will be uh, disclosing uh, publicly a very specific plan uh, in early 2022. But the commitment has been made that uh, basically all city produced emissions, which is probably the least of our challenge, but more importantly, all emissions contributed by our financings will be on net zero carbon basis by 2050. It, it is it is immense project for everybody. It is immense project for us, but uh, uh, promise is a promise. So these four words, uh, if we can click one more. Uh, coming back to our 2025 sustainable progress strategy, it's based on three principles, low carbon transition, climate risk, sustainable operations. Uh, if I go from the back, uh, sustainable operations is probably, uh, I don't have a uh, fun uh, video uh, like ING had with my former colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's very much echoing what has been already said. You know, the responsibility start at personal level, uh, and uh, we will invest into it uh, big times. Uh, and we already started uh, even in uh, the Czech Republic. Uh, um, our former CEO uh, claimed that uh, we are what we measure, so we have measurable goals like that we cut uh, greenhouse emissions by 45%, uh, energy consumption by 40%, water consumption by 30%, waste by 50%, sustainable building. So we will only be in lead uh, uh, and better, uh, lead well and better uh, buildings, et cetera, et cetera. So we have both uh, global uh, and very granular uh, targets about sustainable operations, which as I said, is probably the easiest part uh, but the most important one, because uh, we need to make sure that we win confidence and trust of, the, of, of, of our people, that they do not take it as yet another annoying dimension in their daily activities, but it, it is something that makes sense and that it, it is something to the benefit of everybody to, to, to behave responsibly uh, in this area. And it literally starts at my desk. For instance, I have no waste bin. We only have a recycling bin in, in the office, which drives me crazy, but um, I implemented it. Uh, when it comes to, to climate risk, uh, it is about three key dimensions, policy development, portfolio analysis and measurement and engagement with various uh, stakeholders in this whole story. So. Policy development boils down primarily to the task force on climate related financial disclosures, which is probably the most influential uh, uh, um, organization uh, or movement in this area. Portfolio analysis and measurement is very much about Paris Agreement, uh, Capital Transition Assessment, PACTA. Uh, we never uh, uh, stopped cooperating or adhering to, to, to PACTA uh, uh, in our history. And we very much echo what's going on now in, in US with a, a very probable uh, rejoining uh, of uh, US uh, uh, of, of, of the Paris Agreement. So we will work uh, in close alignment with the US uh, administration and our tasks are pretty much aligned around this. Engagement is uh, very much uh, preach and teach uh, sustainability ESG, ESG work with our clients, uh, we work with our regulators and uh, all relevant stakeholders to make sure that we coordinate as much as possible just because it is so complex that we need to talk to each other and boil down uh, uh, most uh, important stuff into something tangible and uh, something that every single stakeholder is happy to work with. It's probably the most important and most difficult part you know, to, 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 to crystallize something that uh, uh, all stakeholders can accept and can work with. 
And low carbon uh, uh, transition, probably if we click one more. Um, this is, uh, as I said, this uh, 20, 25, 250 billion uh, finance goal, um, environmental finance goal criteria. It is about eight uh, priority areas, renewable energy, water quality and conservation, green building, circular economy, clean technology, sustainable transportation, energy efficiency and sustainable agriculture and land use, usual suspects, very important. We will invest into it even more than before. If you look at financial products, uh, you can have a very, very rich menu of products uh, in this area. So. So uh, very serious about it and very excited about it because it is really the next big thing. Uh, it is next big thing even in uh, the Czech Republic because we expect this 750 billion uh, EU uh, uh, COVID package to start being distributed like next year already. And pretty much, I don't know, two thirds of it is uh, transformational. So I think ESG sustainable products will be very much in demand to, to facilitate transition of, of uh, Czech or slash European economy, economies into, into uh, the, the new uh, uh, normal, which will be very much sustainable and ESG linked. So uh, that's it from from me for now okay uh thank you michael for your very comprehensive uh, explanation you very well described the uh, road uh, which uh, city um, went through the through the decades um, and what uh, you are doing uh, now um, I have actually one question related to the um, net zero emissions. What is City doing globally to get uh, to net zero emissions by 2050? Tell us about that, please. Yeah, I, I think it was bold statement by Jane Fraser, our global CEO, uh, in February, that we're serious about it. And um, uh, there is already a, a, a very senior task force uh, created uh, at the global level that focuses on like preparation of, of, of the plan, how to, how to uh, make sure uh, we have something that's ambitious, realistic, and that's something that will be communicated to, to all, uh, which we'll publish basically in early 2022. So uh, stay tuned, it will come. Uh, but I think uh, it is something that's uh, sending a very strong signal to everybody that day one, new CEO makes a very ambitious statement about net zero by 2050. And again, we, can, uh, we cannot promise and uh, then uh, somehow not deliver. We need to deliver and delivery upon such an ambitious uh, and very complex task is not going to be easy. Yeah, I, I agree. But it's great that uh, you went to this direction, actually. That's, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, can you provide some examples how city in the Czech Republic is supporting the financing of the green solutions? Yeah, this is actually a question which was also asked through the Q&A uh, to um, the um, ING. So I will then ask uh, Eva, please, to answer that question as well. What uh, is ING doing in that, in that area? Please, Michal, if you could answer that question. Well, we are a profit-seeking organization, so we are busy uh, marketing products which make sense and which are ESG. And uh, we already uh, helped print one green bond in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, we're talking to um, our customers uh, because it's a new phenomena for many, but they are very interested. And I, I think not all companies on the local market have the benefit of global background and in-depth knowledge of this of this very complex um, uh, phenomena. So we're talking to them, 
and it's primarily in anticipation of the uh, uh, 750 billion package that will be very much green and very much ESG, very much sustainable. Uh, so it's it's preaching and teaching uh, the gospel of, of ESG and sustainability. Uh, not only because uh, we mean it uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a good thing to do, because we are told to, to do it, but it's because we are believers into it and it's coming so fast on the market that uh, the ones who are ready will be the winners and we want our customers to be ready. Great, thank you very much. Um, Eva, please. Uh, um... There, there was a question congratulating uh, uh, the ING sustainability, sustainability effort, but basically, um, you know, there was uh, also the specific question about what are your, uh, if you could uh, provide some examples of ING uh, activities in, in the Czech Republic specifically. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's very similar uh, to what Michal uh, mentioned already uh, in, in his uh, listing of activities we are doing for our clients. So obviously uh, also green bonds uh, and green lending. As we know, it's a new phenomenon. So there are not that many issuances uh, yet, uh, which were done on, on the Czech market, but uh, many more to come, uh, which is very nice to see. So that, that's one thing as to the products. And then uh, we are having a number of uh, Mondays where we are helping our clients with uh, ESG rating advisory. ESG transformation uh, advisory and we are doing also green structuring uh, for, for many of them. So uh, from that perspective, uh, uh, another part which is developing very quickly is energy transition. So from that perspective, there are uh, many areas uh, where we can help and we are also finding our best ways how to facilitate that process and add value to the processes we are seeing around us. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Actually, if I could expand on that, um, the, 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 there is another question which was addressed to you as well, and uh, which uh, is actually uh, interested in uh, who do you see as the leading investors in the Czech uh, Republic in terms of investing the equity needed, for example, for generating sustainable energy? and if the uh, ING is actually active in, in sustainable uh, energy as well. I think uh, all the banks are really trying uh, their best uh, to, to be uh, a joint uh, leading industry for that. And uh, uh, you might know that uh, uh, 10 Czech banks or Czech-based banks uh, have signed up for uh, sustainability. Uh, already uh, on the floor of Czech uh, Bank Association just a few days ago uh, in order to really facilitate that uh, process of transition and, and be that uh, um, uh, supporter in the process. So that's one thing. Uh, so the banks are doing already a lot uh, in order to, to be there uh, and support uh, these equity investors. But uh, obviously, uh, these are obvious big uh, market players who themselves are running through their transformation now in order to either uh, call phase out or really invest uh, and or uh, invest into new renewable assets, which can uh, rank from biomass into uh, any other areas. Uh, and I think uh, each of them has, uh, uh, has its part in the entire strategy. Yes, yes, I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is an, another question uh, which uh, I would address uh, to, to uh, Pavel. Uh, uh, and that's actually following on his um, presentation. And uh, um, it's asking actually what are the uh, concrete projects uh, that uh, uh, we should prepare uh, for in 2120, according to the upcoming uh, regulations? So I think uh, you should basically prepare for the fact that the banks will ask for the non-financial data, right? This is stipulated by the Sustainability Financial Disclosure Regulation. I think if the company is, is aiming to be part of the product labeled and marketed as a sustainable, 
then the list of information is, is quite ex extensive as prescribed by the regulation. And even if you don't aim to be part of the sustainable the product, then you still may be asked for non-financial performance data. For example, CO2 emissions scope one, scope two, or even scope three, which goes to supply chain, for example, or the questions related to use of the renewable energy or waste management. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for that. Um, if I uh, could have uh, the last uh, question uh, to, to uh, Michal, um, uh, what, what are some of the ESG's uh, um, uh, challenges for city and how are you addressing uh, them? Uh, challenges, um, uh, it is uh, uh, still very high complexity. Uh, it is uh, still not 100% defined framework across the board. Uh, so uh, many customers, which are more of a, of a uh, local or, or regional nature, they just struggle to get up-to-date information. And even though they are interested, they uh, really rely on, on advice be it uh, like consultancies or, or banks. Uh, so some of them just don't know what to want. Uh, and uh, I think that's the key role of, of banks and, and uh, firms like PwC to, to come up with help and uh, help them navigate the waters. Because uh, we are not yet there. Uh, it is not yet settled. Uh, we don't have a universal easy to understand standards for, for all stakeholders. It's very much working progress, many initiatives, many legislative uh, uh, measures already taken uh, to be taken. So uh, sometimes they, people are afraid of it because they think they will no longer be eligible for financing and uh, they will be uh, exited by their financing partners. It is not true. For, for many, uh, even though they may feel vulnerable, but there are solutions which, which uh, can help them not only survive, but prosper even better in the, in the new world. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we could uh, go on and on. There are massive uh, issues related uh, to, to the uh, green uh, finance. Um, uh, let me, uh, but also there are, uh, there, is, uh, there are massive opportunities as well related. Uh, let me thanks to, to all of you. Thank you to uh, Eva Bučová, thank you to Pavel Štefek and thank you to Michal Nebeský. Uh, it was a great pleasure uh, to be on this panel with you and uh, let me um, pass the, the word to Pavel Farah from the British Chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So once again, thank you to all speakers, Eva, Michal, Pavel, and of course Yaroslav, uh, it was very great, very inspiring panel, so thank you all. And I would also like to thank you all participants for being with us until the late afternoon. I would like to remind that uh, the whole conference has been recorded, so you can come back to the recording in case you have missed some part or some speeches, and you can listen it uh, again, or you can listen to the other panels you, you missed. Uh, so in case you have any additional questions, so don't ask, don't hesitate to ask us, or, or the BC speaking, we are very happy to, to answer it later on. And once again, thank you for joining the Green Growth Online Conference. I hope uh, it was inspiring for you and I look forward to seeing you soon, hopefully face to face. So once again, thank you and have a good afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you very Bye. much.